I like how um, it tells you that. <laughs> All right, good morning, everyone. So today um, we're with Cindy O'Meara from Australia. And Cindy began her nutrition journey way back when in 1986 and then published Changing Habits, Changing Lives in 1998. Um, there's been so much that has happened on that journey that I'm actually gonna let Cindy outline that journey for you. But I thought today it'd be really good to talk about a little bit of background about nutrition and things that you can do to empower yourself as we kind of come through summer and then back into our winter in this hemisphere. <laughs> so hello, Cindy. So it's so good to have you here. It's so good to you. It's been a long time since we've had you here because we had you um, a couple of years ago with What's With Wheat, um, which was the documentary, documentary that you filmed ages ago, um, just discussing the whole crisis with wheat and our food in general. Um, which was an amazing documentary. So I'll link that on the bottom as well. So people who haven't seen it yet um, can have a look at that. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah, sure. So I'm from a chiropractic family. Um, my dad was a pharmacist who had a um, patient that, or not a patient, but a client that wasn't coming in anymore for his Pepto-Bismo. And he ran into him in Wellington, New Zealand, and um, said, why aren't you coming in for your, you know, your, your pink stuff? And he goes, oh, I'm going to that quack up the road who happened to be a chiropractor. And this is 1950s. This is the 1950s. And my dad went and visited the chiropractor, wanted to know, well, how did you do that? I thought he'd have to be on that for the rest of his life. So he left pharmacy, became a chiropractor, had to go to the U.S., so I was brought up in a very vitalistic lifestyle. I was brought up that the body is an innate intelligence, give it the right ingredients, it will be the best it can possibly be and, and remove all interference. So giving it the right ingredients is sunshine, um, movement. So sunshine gives us not only vitamin D, but it helps with our circadian rhythms. It has a lot to do with the circadian rhythms of every single part of your body because everything has a different one from the pancreas to the stomach. It's quite incredible. So we've got sunshine, breath, the importance of breath. My dad was always about breath um, and breathing properly through the nose and not through the mouth. So, you know, if there was a problem, he'd do cranial work. I don't know if you do it, Mary Ellen, but he'd do cranial work. Yeah. So, um, and food, my mother was the most incredible cook. So food was a really important part of this, uh, as well as sleep, um, connection with loved ones. There was always people in our home. Mum was always hosting somebody and connection with family. And then, um, of course, chiropractic care. So that was my life. And I'm 61 this year. I have never had an antibiotic. I've never had any form of medication. Um, yes, I've broken bones. I've been in car, like I was hit by a truck once. But my father taught me the importance of as long as you don't need it, don't take it. Um, if you need it in an emergency, do it. Go, take medication. But I'm and I, I put that down to my vitalistic lifestyle, the way um, I was brought up. Um, and the way I live today. So um, because my mum was American, I went to America to go to university because it looked like fun and I wanted to ski. Um, and I ended up doing pre-med at the University of Colorado. And in the first year I picked a few electives and one of the electives I picked was anthropology and cultural anthropology. Had the most incredible um, lecturer, his name was Dennis Van Gerven. And I realized the importance of food and our evolution and I thought, I want to be a dietitian. So I came back to Australia, studied, um, finished my Bachelor of Science majoring in nutrition, was about to go and do dietetics when I didn't agree with anything that I was being taught. I thought, how can I be a dietitian when it has nothing to do with anthropology, cultural anthropology, our heritage with food, and all the things that I'd learned about our survival? H how could we be eating margarine and low fat and artificial sweeteners and all these foods that were manipulated um, how could that be making us healthy? So I thought, well, I, I can't do, I can't be a dietitian. And as a 23 year old, you're kind of going, well, you know, if I can't do that, what am I going to do? So, and you don't think you can go against the grain per se. Um, so I went and did another two years of study um, to become a chiropractor. I did two years of human anatomy, pathology, histology, embryology, all the ologies you can think of, as well as cutting up cadavers. And at the end of six years of study, I went, I know exactly what the human body needs and it doesn't need what the dietary guidelines, which started in 1982, are talking about. It needs real food. So I started as a nutritionist in 1986 at my sister's practice and she was a chiropractor also. 
Um, and I just started to see her patients. And all I did was take them off the, what we call the SAD diet, the SAD standard Australian diet. And we could call yours the SUK, <laughs> the SUK diet. Oh my gosh, the SUK, S-U-K, the SUK diet. Oh, that's the best. Oh, I love it, sorry. Um, anyway, I would take you off the suck diet and put you on a real food diet. And it's just about going back to our roots, back to the way we always ate. Um, and by doing that, we had absolute miracles happen. Like it was incredible, like just by changing their diet. But I have to tell you, we are 40 years on, 35 years on, and I'm seeing that the real food diet doesn't always work because of what they've done to our food. And I guess that's what this topic is going to be about is why is a real food diet not working all the time? Why do I have to go to an extreme? Why is there a vegan diet and a, you know, um, a meat eating diet, you know, a carnivore diet and anything in between? And why do some people do really well on one and others do well on the other? And I, and I, um, and after, you know, studying this for 40 years, I know exactly why this is happening. Um, and, and that's why I did the documentary, What's With Wheat, is that, um, I was a 50 year old doing incredibly well health wise. And then all of a sudden in two years, I was getting back aches and I have chiropractors everywhere, back aches, hip aches, hip pain so bad. I thought I would have to have a, um, a replacement because my friend had had one and I thought, oh gosh, is that, why, why, can't, why is this happening? You know, my brain was getting foggy. I was getting migraines. I was breaking down. I was putting on weight. I'd never put on weight in my life. I'd always been 60 kilos, you know, as long as I can remember, except when I was a baby, but, you know, I'd always maintained that weight. And it wasn't until I did an elimination protocol, um, which I call the fat loss protocol, and I still do today every year, I do it once a year, um, that I realized that a food that we had been eating for probably 23,000 years was causing the problem. And why was it causing the problem? And, and that goes back to our agricultural practices, uh, refining processes, our where it is and, and so much more. And, and all I picked was wheat. I could do a whole documentary on what's with dairy, what's with flavor, what's with colors, what's with synthetic biology, what's with, I could do whole documentaries on these because they are ruining our food. The, um, not only agriculture, but the chemical, um, uh, you know, companies, they and, and really they're one of the same. Agriculture and chemical companies are one of the same now. And it's frightening, actually, isn't it? Because when you look at some of the things coming out in the mainstream media at the moment, talking about how they want to get people off meat and get them on this vegan diet, which means you're going to eat basically an entire chemical diet. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and me being vegetarian, I've never looked for a replacement. What I've just had is more whole food. Right, yeah. which meat is still whole food when it's locally sourced, organic, small farms, small holding type stuff, as opposed to the big agriculture, which is a major, major issue, not just for health, but for the environment is massive, you know, but so, so are all the monocrops, you know, whether it's wheat, whether it's soya, whether it's, you know, corn, all of those things are destroying the environment. It isn't, you know, it's not a battle against um, animal agriculture. It's a battle against the whole system of fakeness and chemistry and <laughs> horrible and things. That, that is the thing and I'm sorry but the vegan movement is going to destroy the planet because and, I, and I'll tell you why as, and I'm not talking about um, you as a vegetarian or someone as a vegan that doesn't eat the plastic fantastic meats cheeses milks all things like that I'm talking about that group of people who don't want to give up meat but think in their hearts know that they've got to give it up because it'll save the planet so they go and eat these plastic fantastic um animal products um or yeah they're plastic animal products that's what they are and the main ingredient is always a monoculture so it could be a soya canola well the second ingredient is usually canola so you've got two huge monocrops that are causing issues so they're spraying um, lots of chemicals on there because of the diseases in these monocultures. If they're genetically modified, they're putting Roundup on, not only pre-seeding, but after seeding and then pre, but after harvest, they can put it on as many times as they, they like because they're Roundup ready. And Roundup ready has a, a chemical in it called glyphosate and glyphosate is a patented antibiotics. So it's not only destroying the ecology of the soil, it's destroying the ecology in our gut. 
So that's why we can't digest food anymore is because we have lost the ability to digest plant-based foods. That's why the carnivore diet is so popular is that when you haven't got a microbiome that can digest those fibers and the resistant starches and the oligosaccharides and things like that, then you will have diarrhea, fructose malabsorption, um, bloated tummies, all of those things. So when you just go on the meat diet, it means you've gotten rid of all those plant-based diets or plant-based foods and you're able to calm the digestive tract down. And But you've got to be able to start eating them again because you've got to feed your microbiome. So another thing those monocultures do is when they destroy the ecology of the soil, they destroy the water holding ability of the soil. So water starts to fall off it, not be absorbed into it. It takes with it all the good nutrients and all the soil puts it in, let's say America puts it into the Mississippi, throws it into the Delta, and basically it's destroying oceans because it's all those chemicals, all the mud and all the dirt, all the topsoils going into the ocean. Another thing that it's doing is that it's not holding organic matter and that organic matter um, holds carbon. So then we start to see more carbon in the atmosphere and you know everyone's going on about carbon, but it's, I believe that chemical agriculture, monocultures, and even um, chemical agriculture with our animals, so our chickens, our cows, our pigs, just the same, they are a big problem on the planet. So if you want to save the planet, let's say you're a vegan listening to me, if you want to save the planet, then you must buy ethical foods in every way. Like if you want to be a vegan, that's fine, but buy ethical. So when you purchase an animal product that's plastic, that's not really an animal, but they make you think it's animal, it has synthetic biology, it has those two, um, the protein and the oil, which is usually canola and soya, or a legume of some sort, or some vegetable oil. So it could be a soybean oil. So they're your two main ingredients. Then after that, there's a string of ingredients to for taste, color, blood bleeding, thickening, binding, um, flavoring. I don't know if I added that one, but it's all of those things that have to be added. So each one of those are being made in a chemical company in China or the US or Europe or somewhere in the world that then has to be flown to that factory that says, I'm going to make a plant-based meat. And everybody's making a plant-based meat because you know how to put it together. So then you've got all those petrol miles, you've got all those chemicals coming together. The worst thing is that those chemicals have only ever been tested by themselves on a mouse. It's not tested on the microbiome. It's only tested on like a mammalian cell or a some, you know, that's what they're testing. So they're, they're testing procedures for safety assessment are archaic and they're from 1987. We know that we are 10% human genetics and we are 90% microbe genetics. We know that 90% of our functions are done by bugs in our body, on our body, in our orifices, wherever they are. 90% of our function is being done by them. We're a symbiotic organism, yet our safety testing is only done on 10% of us and only one ingredient, Band-Aid, one ingredient. <laughs> I was out hiking. <laughs> um, so, you know, only one ingredient is tested. So then they combine 50 ingredients and say, here, it tastes like me, take this. You'll save the planet. It's the biggest crock or you know what. You know, I, and I, I, I feel, I know what vegans are like. And I know what they're like. They are, their passion for saving the planet um, is great because they don't want to hurt the animals. They want to save the planet, but they have been lied to. Just like I was lied to about Australian history. Just like I've been lied to about nutrition, you know. You have to become a critical thinker in this movement. So I, I was a vegetarian for 16 years and um, TVP was the only thing available back in the 70s. So this is the 70s and 80s. And TVP was the only thing. And I tasted it once and I went, ugh. So what they are eating is TVP that has been glorified. That's that's what it is. T Do you remember textured vegetable protein? Yeah, yeah. It made me sick the first time I had it, you know. Yeah. Just you know, the corn stuff, I, I don't know what that, what's in that stuff, but that makes me absolutely violently ill. Yeah. So, it's horrible. so that was what was, that was the only thing available to vegetarians and nobody ate it. Instead, we, we did the macrobiotic diet. We learned how to 
soak our grains and our legumes. We learned how to mix our legumes, our nuts and our grains. We learned, and as vegetarians, we still consumed eggs and dairy. We knew to buy good quality eggs or grow our own eggs, have chickens in the backyard that get rid of all your food produce and give you an egg in, in between, you know, and create this amazing worm garden in your backyard. It's in, just incredible. Um, and, and our dairy, I would always go down to the local dairy and get milk. Back in those days, I could do that. You can't, I, oh, you can in England, I think. I've been to and gotten raw dairy from places and make your own cheeses and your yogurts. We used to make our own yogurts. And this to me is how we'll save the planet. Whether you're a carnivore or a vegan, it's ethical foods, nothing else that will save the planet. As far as saving you, well, then you have to figure that out yourself. What are you better on? Are you good on a vegan diet? Can you last six years plus on a vegan diet or not? Can you last six years plus on a carnivore diet or not? Or do you need something melded in between where you've got small amounts of meat, plant proteins, I mean, so plants, and you live a diversified diet that is what we have adapted to do. We've adapted to both extremes, not vegan, vegetarian, yes. And we've also adapt, we have had to just eat meat in times of disasters or droughts where there is no plants left. So we know that those extremes are tolerated and have been part of our adaptation, um, but everything in between too. So what is it that, you know, makes you feel good, gives you health? You know, when you eat that way, are you feeling good or are you thinking, oh, now I've got this problem and now I've got that problem. Maybe that's not the diet for you. Maybe you need to integrate from the extremes into a better diet once you've healed. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point. And I think, you know, when I'm working with people that are trying to make changes in their diet, the first thing that makes them feel good is actually they're taking control of their diet and they're making a change. They're eating less sugary foods, less cakes and stuff like that. So of course they're going to feel better. So, but the sustainability of change, you have to make it doable in your house, in your busy life. And the things that make you feel good rather than what uh, mainstream media is telling you or the latest trend or the latest fad. And that takes a bit of time and it takes a bit of effort to do that. But I think it's always worth it in the long run because you do start to feel like you can live in your body again. Yeah, exactly. Like and and people. you can enjoy food again. Yeah. Imagine mm. that. Yeah, imagine that. <laughs> and this food, you know, it's not just a survival technique. <laughs> It's actually, you know, we're social creatures, you know, and this year in particular has shown us a lot of that, that, you know, sometimes food isn't just about grabbing something on the run all the time. It is about sitting down and, and enjoying what's in front of you with people, you know, and sharing and communicating and the rest of it. So there's a social aspect to that as well, which I think we've lost over the last few, well, few decades. really. Yeah. And there's the gathering as well. You know, there's, like I have, I have a farm and if I'm up on the farm and I go gather for my meal and then I prepare it straight away, you know, and I can have eggs and salads and sweet potatoes. I've got everything, fruits up there. It's, it just, it's a, it's a wonderful feeling. It's actually um, one of the best things I've ever done is gather for my meal and gather everything on my farm. But you don't need a farm to do this. You can have a farmer's market where you have spoken to your farmers and you know how they are treating their cows and their chickens and who's making the sprouts or who's got the best garlic and chili and who's got the best avocado or banana, you know, you can still gather without having a farm. You can gather at a farmer's market. And if you haven't got a farmer's market, but you've got a local organic store where you know the ethics of that person who owns that food or buys in that food. So I have one, it's called grub. And I actually, any excess I have, I, sell to grub and and she gives me credit in her store you know so it's like this barter system that we use and she knows my ethics even though I'm not certified organic I've just not gone down that route um, but I am chemical definitely I use no chemicals I do regen farming um, and everybody knows my ethics I just I'm a little bit annoyed with the organic movement here in Australia just a little bit um, at times and so I just went I don't need to go down that I don't have to pay them a lot of money 
people know me, they know changing habits. Um, they know if they put up, these are changing habits pumpkins because I've got about a hundred in my car at the moment about to give to grub. Um, they know my ethics and how I grow it and what are my inputs? What are my outputs? You know, I'm syntropic, I'm regenerative. I'm, I love, it's so much fun. So it's the gathering that is really fun too because you meet incredible farmers you meet incredible people, whatever it is, a store. I don't go to the big stores anymore. I refuse to buy from them. Every now and then I have to go into them because I might be traveling and I go straight to the organic section. And even though I get really annoyed because I've got them all wrapped in plastic. Um, yeah, but I will do that on occasion. But for the most part, I, I wanna honor the person who lives in my town I want to honour the farmers who live around my town and I'm going to honour the food that I consume. So it's not just the, the, the eating, it's the gathering. It can become a lot of fun. Um, and I'm sure, Mary Ellen, you have those tools. You know where to send people, you know, in your town. I've been to your town and I, I know you've got those tools, you know. So you've got those tools. Then there's the preparation. There's the... If you've got kids, it's the teaching them. How do you ferment food? How do you make cakes? How do you um, roast a, um, some meat? What's the best way to, you know, cook beans and carrots? I, I don't know. It's we've lost that beautiful, yeah. that beautiful art of gathering, cooking, sharing, and nourishing. So, you know, yeah. so important because it, again, you know, as kids get older and things get busier, they just reach for what's easy you know, instead of actually putting some forethought into what's going to nourish them as part of their day. And I think that is such an important thing that needs to be reclaimed, really, you know, and it does take more effort, you know, like on Monday nights, my kids are supposed to be doing all the cooking, <laughs> which is essentially means that, you know, and it is more work intensive for me in the beginning, because I have to be there and show them how to do things. But then once they got the hang of it, and then they start to want to experiment, and they kind of get the idea of, of the basics of how not to burn things and all the rest of it, then they can go off and do that. And I, it's much easier than I can sit back and they take control of that. And they, it empowers them to make choices about things, about what foods go with what, and you know what spices taste better with this and that, and how long things take to prepare. And I think it is, an, for a parent, it does take more skill. time. Pardon? What an incredible skill it is. that I, they huge skill because most of their friends can't cook at all you know and when I say oh Abby's gonna Abby's just making a roast dinner for tonight and they're like really she was 12 when she knew how to do that mm. you know and she's she still has to put all the pieces together sometimes that they all come out at the same time but you know she can make a really beautiful meal and there's several meal different meals that they can cook very easily that I don't have to worry that about what they're going to eat you know I'm not home yeah, I, and I, I've got adult children now, you know, they're 32, 30 and um, 28. And and they have both, all of them, men, boys and girls, they have the skills to nourish themselves. And I watch them teaching their friends who have never been taught those skills. And we have lost that art of that nourishment. And that's why the TV dinner or the lean cuisine or the healthy choice or the, uh, I don't know what you've got over there, but, you know, the foods that you just have bought in or uber eats or whatever it is you know you know like to have them occasionally um like the uber eats from a really good restaurant okay but when it comes to most of those foods that i already talked about you know where it's just junk food really even though it says lean cuisine and healthy choice um they are they're dangerous foods they're dangerous to the planet and they're dangerous to the human species the plastic they're wrapped in the cardboards have got um, cancerous, toxic colours on them that leach through the plastic into the food. We know this stuff. If people continue to buy these packaged foods, like I don't, I don't buy packaged foods. I, you know, we have a place here in Australia called Source, and you go in, you take your jars, and you just um, get your jar. The jars are all weighed, and you put your nuts and your grains or your seeds or your legumes in them, and you don't have to use packaging anymore. And I think it's just a matter of um, you seeking those places out, 
um, is to be and to have the least amount of waste to think you could put a rubbish bin out with no rubbish in it like my husband and I did that last week I went it's no point in putting the rubbish out we got no rubbish this week you know just it's quite incredible and our compost you know we, we compost everything and the chickens get that we you know we don't have to put that in in the rubbish bin either you know you know I don't know we I, th I think as a society I think corona covid um and this pandemic that is worldwide I believe it's waking people up to what is really important and why are we in this position we are right now is it the virus or is it the terrain and in my way of thinking it's the terrain it's the human terrain it's the environmental terrain it's the it's every terrain that we have around us that is causing the issues we're seeing today that virus could not take hold in a health it can't take hold in a healthy terrain and and that's been proven it's been shown that you know under the age uh, under a certain age the chances of you getting it are uh, zero 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 point three or something or you know point zero 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 three or something like that the older and more chronically diseased you are the higher the chances are of not only contracting it getting a bad version of COVID-19 but also passing from it and I think that uh, people have seen that so now we see how sick our terrain is not only in the human body but the agricultural body and that is what is um, causing this and when you have outbreaks of listeria so listeria um, is resistant to glyphosate. It's, um, it's like when, let, let's talk about the microbiome, which is in our gut. So the microbiome has always a balance of um, bacteria that can be dangerous and bacteria that are good. As long as the good ones are outweighing the bad ones, then you will stay well. Those bad ones sometimes, we call them bad, but it's symbiotic. Um, I'm just using those terms because they, they seem to do that. So those ones that could be more pathogenic as opposed to the good keystone ones are kept at bay, but they could be producing something for the human body that we haven't figured out yet. Or your microbiome is your first line of defense. And if it's been killed by antibiotics, non-steroidal um, anti-inflammatories, um, PPIs, which are um, proton pump inhib inhibitors, which are an like an antacid or an antacid. If you um, are allowing a dangerous pathological microbe to get into your body because you have stopped the beautiful terrain, healthy terrain working, then that's when you're going to be in trouble. And the same is going for our agriculture. So it's got the same. It's got pathological bacteria and it's got um, or microbes and it's got healthy microbes and there's always a beautiful balance. But when you wipe out the healthy ones with an antibiotic called glyphosate, and listeria has the ability to um, outwit glyphosate, basically. It doesn't have the enzyme um, that the other ones have. You then have listeria outbreaks on cucumbers and lettuces. And so I don't know if you heard, but in Australia, they've just passed a law, not a law, but a act, or I don't know what it is, that they will irradiate all of our fruits and vegetables because of, yep, yep. I just got the letter today. Yeah, for a while in Europe, because they gamma, gamma ray them or something like yeah. that in transport. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so Food Standards Australia and New Zealand um, have said, yes, we, we're going to do it to all fruits and vegetables. And this is why you have to start kind of going, when, like I did an opinion piece on this because I knew that they were doing this. Um, and I basically said, so when you have all your scraps and you throw it into your compost heap, and one day a pumpkin pops up and then a tomato pops up and some lettuces pop up and they're not going to pop up. They're dead. The seeds are completely irradiated and they are dead. So we are killing the seeds of our foods. Um, so food sa seed saving is going to become a really, really important um, thing that we need to do. Um, and I'm probably, you know, jumping the gun here, but I think people need to be, it's not that I want to frighten people, but I want to, I've been doing this for 40 years. Um, I understand this. So if I can at least spark your attention to go, I'm going to buy from my local butcher, my local dairy, my local um, fruit and vegetables. I'm going to go to my farmer's markets. I'm going to go back to cooking the way my mum cooked or my, my grandma cooked. 
that's a start. That is a great start. Um, and then move on from there and then become, and the only way you're going to become an activist is to do that. Because if you continue to buy those foods, then you're saying, oh, I don't care what the big multinationals are doing and the big chemical companies and agriculture. I don't care what they're doing. Um, and that's what you're saying when you buy those foods. But if you care, then you will just make that little bit of an effort. Go to Mary Allen. She'll give you where everybody is. <laughs> and she'll, do you have, you have a Thermomix? No, I don't actually. No. But I have to work around it the old fashioned way. <laughs> the old fashioned way. Which, you know, which is easy to do. Um, you don't need a Thermomix, but I, I have had one for. Life easier, yes. 15, 16 years and. You know, and I've got the old one, you know, although Thermomix Australia has given me a new one, but I love my old one. <laughs> and, you know, I just, I uh, look, to me, it means I've got a, an apprentice in the kitchen and you can buy them secondhand. I have an apprentice in the kitchen. And while that's making my Bernays sauce or my Hollandaise sauce or my mayonnaise or my pesto, I'm over chopping something else and getting the meat prepared. And yeah, so it, it just depends on, you know, whether you you want to do that um, or do it. Yeah, the old fashioned way. Chop, chop, chop. <laughs> Very true. But it's awesome, isn't it? Because we talk about things that should be normal, you know, and like like cooking. Amazing, you know, and the health of our foods. But I think people don't really understand that, you know, what goes in your mouth and through the, that microbiome or the lack of microbiome is what's going to dictate the expression of your life, mm. you know, which is the massive things. And I know certainly in chiropractic terms, we look at the whole of the, the system, whether it's the chemical, emotional, physical, spiritual. But if all of that is unplugged from the basics of just what is going into your body then you are already in trouble because that affects everything, you know, in terms of the digestion, how well your body forms, how well it grows, how well it maintain, maintains itself, all of those things and the way you think, you know, and particularly, you know, this virus has really shown people that these communities are so unwell. They're so unwell to begin with. They do not have the terrain to withstand anything that comes through it. And there's lots of different ways to approach it. And I think adding more chemicals and thinking it's the, your get out of jail um, card is the wrong approach. And I think you need to sit and take stock and take a look at what's happening around you and then start making changes in your life to improve your health quite seriously. Because, you know, as we go into another winter here, you know, and gratefully that, you know, the virus is now kind of endemic and the one, the variants that are going around now aren't anywhere close to what it was like last year, which is great. So we have that, but also if you don't make changes, if this hasn't been a wake up call to make changes in your whole life, not just in terms of what goes into your mouth, but looking at the bigger picture of the agriculture and the choices you make in shopping and growing if it's possible for you because you know not everybody has a garden but you can still grow things i have a garden i still in my kitchen i'm growing things because the weather has been so unstable anything i've put outside has died <laughs> so I've, I've just my kitchen is a jungle again this year because i worried about putting stuff out and losing it so i think yeah i think it comes down to the choices that you're making and just taking mm -hmm. time to research a little bit, ask for help, start talking about things. And, you know, not and what are your priorities? Yeah. Mm. Priorities are huge, isn't it? And, you know, you can have greenhouses in, you know, like we can't, uh, we can't have greenhouses up here. We'd burn everything. It, like I'm in the subtropics. But you can have greenhouses, small greenhouses in your garden and grow your lettuces and tomatoes. And it's, it's just, it's so much fun to do it with your kids as well. Because if, if they are gamma raying or and irradiating our food, our food's dead. You know, it has no microbial life in it. And that's why they're doing it is because of microbes. They used to just sterilize the outside and now they're sterilizing the inside. So those rays go through the food, killing every bit of bacteria. But that bacteria is there to fulfill your need for more bacteria, to help you digest food that bacteria is in that food to help you digest that food. And I see people with allergies to lettuce now. 
where they cannot eat lettuce because the microbes are gone from the lettuce because they've been sterilized. And that's why growing food, you know, is, is really important because then you at least have control of the lettuce at least. You know, lettuce is like weeds. They grow really well. And so are herbs. And you can start adding those beautiful foods, in, you know, into your life. And I think um, if, if people are thinking, well, I'm not a vegan and I'm not a carnivore, I eat like an omnivore, I can eat, you know, those packaged foods. Well, what they're doing to packaged foods at the moment um, and the additives that they're putting in, I, I believe is, is becoming scarier by the, <laughs> by the decade. Um, so they've started this new way of producing additives. So you might see citric acid or xanthan gum. You might see um, if you're, you eat plastic meat, they'll see something called lega hemoglobin. You may see microbial rennet in your cheese because people have a, have a thing about rennet, um, which is the, you know, the enzyme from the, the stomach of a calf or a cow that helps the cheese curdle. Um, so what they're doing now is because of, and vanilla, they do it with vanilla flavoring, or they do it with, you name it, they're doing it with it. So what they're doing is that they've figured out if they genetically modify a microbe, a mold, a, a virus, because there's, there's this um, new genetically modified virus that they spray on meat now to kill listeria. Yep. And then you consume that. Um, so it can be a virus, a mold, a fungi, a bacteria, any one of those that they can genetically modify that they know really well. And so what they do for vanilla flavoring is that they'll, they'll get a, a microbe. It's actually, I think it's a microbe. I don't know if it's a fungi, can't remember, but they'll get a microbe. They'll take the smell of the vanilla bean gene out of the vanilla bean because vanilla has become very expensive. 75% um, of the world market, they can't fulfill. So only 25% of the vanilla market they can fulfill because of um, there was, I think, uh, there was some sort of storm in Madagascar and we lost a lot of the vanilla beans and they take a long time, or vanilla plants, and it takes a long time to, to regrow them. So they've figured out this, that they take the gene of the smell of the vanilla, they put it into the microbe, through CRISPR technology, which is genetically modified. Then this bacteria lives on plastic. So they get recycled plastic, put the bacteria on the plastic and it produces a chemical that is called natural vanilla flavor. That's in our food. And you don't know. You won't know if it's made by that genetically modified microbe or it's got a hundred chemicals in it or um, it's from the bum of, the, of a, a beaver or wherever they're getting it from or the pulp papers. There's many ways that you can make vanilla flavoring and you won't know. Citric acid is a genetically modified mold. Xanthan gum is a genetically modified mold that used to be on broccoli and cauliflower. And that was that black stuff that you get on broccoli and cauliflower. That's your xanthan gum. So now they've figured out how to genetically modify it, put it on a substrate of some sort, whether that's plastic or soya or sugar or whatever that substrate is and then it produces xanthan gum and they're getting really really good at it really good at it um but it it's not food and it never will be food and we do not know the consequences so there's a disease out there it's called Morgellons disease and Morgellons disease is used to be seen by doctors as a mental disorder because people would come in and they'd have fibers coming out of a cut or a crack or something like that. And so they, they figured that what they were doing was rubbing up against carpet and coming in with this mental disorder. But now they've figured out that it's um, associated with a microbe that produces fibers, that is possibly being genetically modified to make fibers. Because synthetic biology, which I'm talking about, makes all sorts of things. It makes vaccines, it makes drugs, medications, um, biofuels, um, it's in so many industries because it's cheap labor, <laughs> it's bugs, but the disasters of one of these bugs escaping is what's scary. So while it might be ethically okay to genetically modify microbes on a, as opposed to humans or animals or plants, disaster wise, if you genetically modify a, a human, 
the disaster is not going to be as big as it when you genetically modify a microbe and it escapes and gets into our microbiome. I often laugh, I make jokes when I'm speaking and I go, well, perhaps if I get that vanilla producing microbe, I'll just smell like vanilla all the time. You know, <laughs> we don't know the consequences. Like basically we have no idea. So me as a human, as, as an individual have, have chosen that I will buy nothing that has an additive in it now, because I don't know, unless I look up the patent, um, whether that is going to be synthetic biology or biotechnology that they're using, or whether that is coming from citrus, such as citric acid, it comes from citrus, you know, I don't know. So I'm not, I'm, I made a stand that um, I can only eat real foods now. That's it. I only eat real foods. And do you know that emulsifiers, so just read emulsifier, it might say soya lecithin or sunflower lecithin. It's in all chocolates. Um, it's in mayonnaises, anything that needs to stay together where the fat and the liquid need to stay together. Um, these emulsifiers kill the bacteria that makes the mucus layer that lines your single cells in your gut to protect you just an emulsifier. And, and this is, That's we're hideous. not testing this. Pardon? That's hideous. It's hideous. Yeah. But we're not testing these additives on the microbiome. We're only testing it on our 10% mammalian cells. Remember, it's a 1987 um, safety um, assessment and the microbiome isn't there. And But microbiologists are beginning to do this testing and seeing the result. So if you want to save your health, your children's health, it's easy. You just got to start cooking again, gathering, cook, cooking, and enjoying a family meal. That's it. That's all we got to do. It's not hard. It's interesting, isn't it? Because the rest of all of that information is so overwhelming. It's incredibly overwhelming just how, if you'll pardon the expression, bastard artist our system has become, you know, mm. in the name of ease, in the name of convenience and everything else. And I think, I think we Cheap. are the fallout Cheap. of, you know, we're seeing it in the lower fertility rates, lower pregnancy rates, um, you know, with all of the synthetic stuff, not just in terms of what we eat, but in terms of there's a, there's a pill for every ill, you know, and it's, you know, without having to bear the consequence of that. Um, so then you, all you do is kind of push it on a little bit further and pay a higher price later on right. both physically and mentally In because way. you you made that mention um because it's not just your physical body that's being affected it's your the way you think the thoughts you think um the amount of depression that i'm seeing you know i i i've been following this girl on instagram and she's fiery you know she is just fiery and i don't know who she is i'm um, somebody just said you should follow this girl and I think she lives in America her name's um Ali Zek or something Ali, Ali Ali Zek something like that anyway I didn't know her story and her story was an abusive marriage um antidepressants um eating poor food because the doctors said oh you just need this antidepressant yeah it it, it was it was scary and more and more drugs and more and more sickness. And she got worse and worse and worse. And then um, she just thought, well, I'm doing the same thing and getting the same result. I have to do something different. And she heard a podcast. She listened to a podcast of um, a psychiatrist that had turned very natural. And so, and that was Dr. Kelly Brogan. Do you know Dr. Kelly? Yeah, yeah. yeah brilliant. It was Dr. Kelly Brogan and I've been following Kelly, like her partner is in my um, documentary, What's With Weed, and I just love them, um, Say Jai and, and Kelly Brogan. Anyway, she was listening to a podcast with Kelly Brogan and Kelly had this program, which was all about, you know, food and um, lifestyle, just what we've been talking about, nothing different. And it changed her life. And so then she started to look down rabbit holes, started to look at, when, you know, everything, and, and then of course now has become quite a mouth when it comes to the vaccine, coronavirus, um, the tests, what's in the tests, you know, all of that. Yeah. She's become, and she goes, I just haven't been somebody that's just gone, oh, I'm just gonna throw this out here. I've, I have a history of what the medical fraternity did to me. And I have a history of what natural health has done to me. 
And I'm just letting you know that I'm down that rabbit hole. I had to educate myself to turn my life around. And this is what's happened mentally and physically. And her son, oh, I just I cried this morning. Her son wrote about their life. And he said she committed suicide, tried to commit suicide many times. And him and his sister didn't know whether they, and then, oh, look, it's just one of those stories, I think. Now I understand your background. I understand why you're so feisty about what's happening and, she, and her words are beautiful. It's like she just, I don't know what it is, but this is what we need. We need more people like this, people that have gone, I've been to the dark side. I know what will happen and I want to come to the light side. I want to be awakened both physically and mentally. Um, and when you see them do this and, you know, I've, I've thousands of people that have followed me and turned their lives around with, and I don't do anything, by the way. All I do is give information, just like Kelly Brogan. She just gives information. But then that person says, I have to do this. And then step by step, habit by habit, bit by bit, they do it. And it absolutely transforms themselves, their family, their lives. And, and it's just about saying, I'll just take the first step. And um, I wrote my book, Changing Habits, Changing Lives, what, 1998, and it's now um, Lab to Table. You can see it behind me. Um, it's now called Lab to Table because it is now Lab to Table. What we've been talking about is expressed in there. And what I do at the end of each chapter is I give you action steps. So I, I talk about breakfast cereals and what's wrong with breakfast cereals and how they're made and what they add to it and, and the glyphosate that's in them. And, you know, so I talk about that. Then I go, Okay, so if you don't want to eat breakfast cereals anymore, what do you have to do? Here's a few recipes. Here's a few action steps. Do that until it's a habit in your life. And then and we might talk about salt and dairy and wheat and um, synthetic biology and additives and flavors and, you know, and go through the whole gamut of food. And just think that if you start this week and you say, I'm going to stop eating breakfast cereals, low-fat milk, white sugar, margarine and toast and Marmite, I think you guys eat, you know. Is it Marmite? Is it Marmite? We have Vegemite. I don't like Marmite, but. <laughs> yeah, whatever, jam or something like that. So I'm just, I'm going to stop having that for breakfast and I'm going to have a real food for breakfast. I might even change from a carbohydrate breakfast to a maybe omelette for breakfast. And, you know, you might think, oh, that's too hard. I don't have time. I, all I have time is, no, you have time. You have time. It might take a couple more minutes longer, but if you organize, it doesn't even take any time. Um, so, you know, just to do that one thing and then do that for as long as you can until it's a part of your life, easy, you know what you're doing, and then you go to go to the next step. And let's see where you'll be in 52 weeks. Imagine changing one little thing a week from your salt habit, your spices habit, from fake spices to real organic spices that actually have medicinals from crap dairy that's that I've seen. Um, what did I see in there? The fish oil. I saw fish oil in dairy the other day. I went, oh my gosh, omega threes, you know. You know, these crazy things. You just go to normal dairy, normal cheese, just normal stuff. Even if you don't start organic or biodynamic or syntropic or regen farming, even if you just start with the basics, and then in a year, how far you've come. And then you go, right, how can I improve each one of these steps now? Can I be organic in this way? Can I find a better quality here? Or can, you know, so, yeah. No, it makes a big difference. And I think, again, making it easy, like some people come in and they just want to wipe the plate clean. And actually that's a recipe for failure, I think. And I think just one step at a time makes such a big difference, you know? And I mean, I've always done cook breakfast, my girls, and people are like, how do you have time for that? I said, well, I get up half an hour earlier to do that. Hmm because that's one of my major priorities is that my kids are healthy, you know, and having watched them both go through COVID this time without like blinking an eye for basically because they are really healthy and their systems do respond really well and they recover really, really well. And now they have immunity, which is wonderful. Um, so, and it's been really good, you know, and I think it, it is your priorities and your changes. And if you look at your core values, you know, the things that are important to you and how you want to design your lifestyle and your family, all of those simple changes make a huge difference, you know, so it doesn't have to be overwhelming to do all of those things in a day or in a week, 
taking a year and doing one thing, even if you change one thing in 30 days, at the end of a year, you will still have a completely different lifestyle from where you've started. And the nice thing is that when you start doing things like that, you gain a momentum with it and you also gain clarity in your brain and energy to keep going. Because all of it, when you start to feel good, you want more of what feels good. Right? So, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, and that's the thing is that you will start to feel better. We know, we know the results of this. This is this is thousands of years old, this this advice. It's nothing, it's nothing new. It's very old. But food is not the only thing that I look at um, because we also have to look at the cultures and how they lived in anthropological times. They were outdoors. They saw sun. They slept. They didn't have bright lights in their eyes. So there's, there's, a, there's a whole lifestyle that can come with this. Um, so I, I gave up television. I, I went to Joe Dispenza and... That was probably October three or four years ago. Yeah, I, I had a, I did um, a progressive with him and then I did advanced. And after that, I went, I don't need to know what's happening in the world as far as on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, if something important happens, they'll tell, somebody will tell me, you oh, know. Yeah. <laughs> they'll tell me. So I gave up television and radio, any um, mainstream media, I just, gave up and I selected the media I wanted to listen to, which are podcasts. So um, when you do that, you find you have so much more time because the average, I don't know what happens in UK, but the average Australian watches a hell of a lot of television. And I probably could find myself sitting down and maybe watching a couple of shows, which is two hours of my life. And so when you give up mainstream media, then you have that extra time in your life and you're not being fed um, disasters in your life. And my brother says to me, if nobody told us that what was happening in the world, we'd be living as though life was fine, you know, because really it's a media storm. It's not the pandemic that they're making out to be. It's a media storm. So giving up mainstream media and choosing the media you want, like your media, like what you're doing, Mary Ellen, listening to information that will help improve your life, whether it be whatever you, you know, you're doing. And I know you would do the whole gamut of stuff that will improve people's lives. So it's sleeping, making sure you go to bed um, with sometimes, like last night, I think I was asleep by 7.30, quarter to eight, but then I'm up at five. Um, I go down to the beach. I live on a beach. Um, so I go down to the beach, I do a breathing session with a group of people. It's a 40 minute breathing session. So we do breath work um, based on Wim Hof. Um, but I did it because I read a book called, by, called Breath by James Nestor. He's, I think he's an Englishman. I'm pretty sure he's English. He, look, he's just brilliant. It's the best book. So we do a 40 minute breath session and then we dip into the cold waters um, and it is cold at the moment. Look, I have winter gear on. So this morning, I, I can't. Oh, well, people are two different things. No, I know. <laughs> it's, it's probably 17 degrees in the water at the moment. <laughs> at, at, in the summer, it's 26. <laughs> but it, it is cold. It's cold compared to what I'm used to. So then we, we swim in the ocean and then I come home. I make my breakfast and my lunch. I'm at work right now. Um, I come to a nice environment. Um, I go home, how did I make a beautiful meal together? At the moment, I actually go to my grandbaby. So um, I, 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 I'm a grandma, or they call me Jima. So that happened nine weeks ago. So I don't know, I just, I stay within, I, I don't want to have mass media lying to me anymore. I want to choose my media. Um, I choose to continue my lifestyle um, which is sunshine, rest, breath, good food, movement, um, connection with family, like my family every Thursday night. And remember, I have older kids with partners. Every night we do, every Thursday night we do family dinner. But they were at my place yesterday, which was Sunday. They were at my place um, Saturday night. It was my daughter's 30th birthday. They were all there, you know, like I have this huge family now of, I love it. You know, this, this to me is, it was all I need and all I want in life. I don't 
need, want for anything or need for anything. And then we all go up to the farm and we have camp overs and sleepovers and open fires and look at the stars. This is what we did as hunter gatherers, as agriculturalists, as herders. Modern society, our body is not modern. It is ancient. It is old. And I'm not saying that in age wise, I'm saying that in evolutionary wise. We have not adapted to being indoors, not moving, eating crap food. We have not adapted. There is no way when we can see that with the amount of chronic disease. So we have to fake all of those things that our ancestors did back into our lives again. Get outside at midday, get that midday sun. Make sure that you're not wearing sunglasses and sunblock and, you know, things like that. Within reason, you have to, you know, you, you need to be, you can't stay out all day, but within reason you do these things. Um, and the breath work, I've realised that ancient cultures have done it forever. And so I thought, well, I'll get back in. And, oh, my gosh, I, I tell you what, when all this COVID started back in March last year in Australia, we we had lockdowns and because I didn't know anything about the virus, there was no information, no data. Um, we didn't know what it was about. We didn't know where we were going, what we were doing, how our business would go. We, we weren't even allowed to have more than 10 people in our home. I started to get anxiety, heart palpitations, because anxiety is looking towards the future and not knowing what's going to happen. Depression is looking at the past. So I started to think, what's, what's going to happen with our future, blah, blah, blah. So I read the book Breath and I went, okay, I'm going to start doing it. Well, I have been absolutely vigilant. I do it five days a week, 40 minutes every morning. And I have to tell you, in any time that I am anxious or hyperventilating about something, I do my breath work and I just have to tell you, it's incredible. It's just incredible. So, um, and then my swim and it's all incredible, but it's, it's about you putting the work in and you will reap the results. It's interesting actually to see swimming here through the winter. Like I've done it for years since Holly started school, but not as consistently as this year. And because of all the weird changes this past year, and one of our local ladies started a group and there was about 30 people. And now there, I think there's over 2000 in it and obviously not swimming at the same time, but it's created a really lovely community for support through all the different lockdowns and through all the different things that have gone on. And it's been a real gift, I think, to particularly the women in this community to be able to find each other and find like-minded people who are in need of that connection and support and it, it's been really wonderful you know so that and local communities that local community in every way is the way we used to live our lives and we weren't global and I kind of think we need to get back to being a local community in the food that we we support our local farmers. By the way, 75% of the food eaten on the planet um, comes from five acres or less. Oh, that's amazing. That's it's not coming from monocultures. It comes from five acres or left of the people. That's India. We're talking India, China, Africa. Um, and even, you know, people like me, I'm not buying from anything more than five my 60 acres but I'm not buying from big acreage I'm not buying monocultures so we know that the planet can be supported by five acres or less isn't that amazing because every other kind of conversation about save the planet starts with there's too many people you know <laughs> and I think the sustainability of the, our systems is the problem not the people and no. I think yeah we just need to start from that kind of grassroots side again which takes a little bit of learning and a little bit of effort because everything in schools has been taught away from that. It's all about chemistry. You know, it's nothing about the natural side of things and health and how to, how to forage and how to find things, you know, which fortunately in Cornwall is a big thing, right? You know, foraging and the sea and fishing and um, local small farms, you know, so we are very lucky here. Definitely. <laughs> Uh, and, and I love oh my god <laughs> I think we're gonna have to have a part two. <laughs> oh. oh gosh it's 439 oh. 
No, I to get children to school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. Your morning, I'm late in the afternoon. I get to go see my grandbaby. <laughs> I'm going to get my little one to school and then I'm going to go for a seat swim. <laughs> so first, first day of sun in a week, which is good. So oh, good. Thank you so much. And if you're up for doing a part two, I will love to talk to you again and again and again because there, you're just such a huge wealth of information you know and the experience that you have and because you've been in that game for so long you do have such a broad vision of where we've come from and where we're going and this we just need to stop the train okay. mm. yeah and the small so do you have copies of my book in the office i do and i'm actually i'm gonna have to order more because i think i've only got one left so well let everybody also know one. i don't have the lab to table one yeah, that's just come out. Uh, you would have had Changing Habits, Changing Lives, which is the same, but we've just updated with Lab to Table um, with the name. Um, but you can also get it on um, Audible. You can get it on Kindle. Um, and, and we'll send you more books if people need it. But I think it's a good start. Um, and there's also changinghabits.com.au that people can go to and, and look at blogs. There's lots of blogs that... You can learn about synthetic biology, which I, I touched on. You can, I, I just have written an article on will being a vegan um, save the world? It's not um, up yet, but it will be and coming out. But there's all these things that, um, that I, I just, in very much their opinion pieces, there are references, but it's just to make people, not make, help people. I don't want to make anybody do anything. I just want to give them the information and have inquiry. And I think that that is the most important thing we need at the moment is more people having questions around the narrative of food um, and just everything that's happening at the moment on the planet. Just have a question about it. Question well, it. Where, where yeah. could I get information? The information is coming from big chemical companies. That's not education. That's a sales pitch. And I think it's, it, you have to discern the difference in that you know and sort of back from when they swapped from all the natural stuff like butters into margarines and all of that kind of stuff and the anti-fat movement and all that kind of stuff that's a chemical sales pitch that is not nutrition and so you it does take time to kind of go oh, wait a second you know is that true or is that not true you know because even now in my practice people are just like oh low fat this and i'm just like oh. <laughs> 20 years of educating people that you know your brain doesn't work if you don't have fat. Don't, well, when the world know. opens up again, I'm coming to Cornwall. <laughs> oh, we still get this England you. so much. I miss all my travels, but anyway. Yeah. Well, I want to come down and see your farm. <laughs> so definitely You're welcome anytime. Down there. So anytime. Yeah. But thank you so much. And I am going to come after you for a part two because I think there's just such a huge amount of information to cover. And I think, again, opening up that idea that you can question things and start taking simple steps and things like that is so important, you know, to empower people that actually you do have control over this, you know, and the, and the choices you make matter. Hmm. Sounds good. I'm, I'm there for you, Mary Ellen. I'd love to do it. It took us a little bit to get to this one. I'm so sorry, but we will get there. I'll be able to do it. Definitely. Brilliant. All right. Well, I will see you soon. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.